I had no idea that there were so many people in the world that believed the Earth was flat. One is too many, but apparently there are dozens. Um, anyway, one of them on social media challenged the people that believe in the globe Earth to answer the question of what is beyond space? What is at the edge of space and what is beyond Space. So I have to pause this video to, to keep prevent the recording to pick up my laughter. You don't get points asking complex cosm cosmological questions that theoretical physicists have answered, but the common layperson will give you, you know, like a half-assed answer or something that's just kind of ad hoc based on what they understand something. And so you, since they can't answer it, then you don't, hey, that doesn't mean the world's flat. That's a kind of uh, cool thing about um, the universe is that there is no end to the universe and yet it is finite at the same time because it does on a scale that large things don't work like on a scale like this okay and um, physicists have to use formula to to address these kinds of situations and if you can't think abstractly then uh, you're going to be lost there's a limited amount of space, yet, if you travel in a straight line, you'll go, an object traveling in a straight line, perfectly straight line, will never hit any, will never stop. It'll hit something, eventually, I suppose, but theoretically, it will keep on going forever. Now, to understand how that works, imagine that you had a telescope, an infinity telescope. And it's a magical telescope because you can look at things through this magical lens and see things as they exist right now. You can see them as they exist currently. Normal telescopes in the real world, when you look through them, you'll see things as they were because it takes a long time for light to come to the telescope. Sometimes hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years. Sometimes you see things as they were hundreds of years ago if that object is hundreds of light years away. So let's suppose we have a magical telescope that you can look through and you can see things as they are exactly now. It doesn't use light, it uses some other property that doesn't exist, but we're just being hypothetical. And you could see, that's one thing about this special telescope, this magic telescope, is that you can see things as they are now and you can see things as far away as you want. And let's suppose you cranked up that telescope up to um, a couple dozen billion years. And you keep kept going. And then you look through it, or a couple billion light years, the distance, that's what I'm saying. And you kept going, and you look through it, what you would see through this magic telescope is the back of your head. Not far out. And it would be the same if you, if you looked up. Well, if you're floating in space, you'd see the back of your head still. I mean, if you're standing on Earth, you'd see the opposite, the opposite side of the Earth. Because the universe kind of works like that. It, it kind of works on a, on a huge, massive scale, the highest scale possible. You couldn't see it. It would be, it would be something that would be, that would be like... An, Unvisible. You couldn't see outside the universe because you're viewing it. Got it? You'd have to. You're part of the universe. You'd have to be inside. So you can't actually step outside the universe. It's almost like we're enclosed in a giant um, equation. And you know, incidentally, when I was in high school, someone someone had that kind of theory about that we all live in the mind of God. That things on a subatomic level, they don't work like matter anymore. They work like little equations and they interact with other equations. And you have to write them out in equations like they're a thought. And so that's why when I was a kid, people would talk about how we live inside the mind of God. 
and it's sort of like it's an, it, it can't be viewed in a tangible way. Just the, the massive, largest scale view of the universe can't be perceived in a tangible way, just like the minuscule subatomic infinitesimal view of subatomic particles can't be viewed in a tangible way either. In fact, when you get down to quantum mechanics, things start behaving really weird, and they can't, you can't have a model. It's like you can have a model of an atom. You can't have a model of the, the, the individual minuscule parts of an atom. They start acting like equations. Well, the universe on a large scale acts act kind of like an equation as well. This is, you know, and since I'm not a physicist, I know that a physicist can explain this better, but I also know that I know enough about this to know what they would say in a kind of layman's term so I can put it in a way that other people can understand it. Another analogy, you're, you're seeing the game Asteroids where, um, you know, there's a spaceship boop, boop, flying around and shooting Ast shooting little pulsars at a, at a floating asteroid and it breaks apart in little smaller pieces. They're not popular anymore, but back in the 70s they had them around. And if you flew off the edge of the universe, you'd reappear kind of like on a on what would be perceived as a, as a rational location where you would pop up. I think over here you might well pop up over here go like this and you'd pop up over here like this. Right when you disappear, come like this. The game asteroids is a lot like how the universe works, but the, a person riding in the spaceship wouldn't know that he passed some barrier. So another way of explain, okay, so the asteroid thing is, I think, is a really good analogy. Another way is that there is no center to the universe. It's not like a melon, and you crack it open, you find the center of it. The Big Bang happened everywhere, but the universe, in an equatorial, you know, uh, in a um, kind of abstract way, was very small. So that field where you would you would travel and reappear, and you could actually see the back of your head, was all condensed down to a singularity when the, when the Big Bang happened. And so the repeatable, the amount of space that exists in the universe has been expanding. And um, explaining that gets into some formulas and stuff that some of them that I've written and I've sent off to nature. So um, they might be right and they might be wrong, but this is a good way of explaining it that I found. And I know what I am right about because it makes sense. And Paul is, is in tune with what I've learned from watching uh, science programs. Eight minutes is long enough.